higher negative connotation for a specific thing we would try to avoid purchasing that product because we feel that the person close to us might we might lose our proximity or our relative proximity with the people people that we are very close with so rather we go with their wishes also so these are certain intentions that is attitudes of others as well as unanticipated factors which basically define whether we intend to be making a purchase intention and going for a purchase decision so even after we have evaluated our alternatives and we have made a purchase intention we would like to have the opinion of others uh, definitely uh, when we go shopping uh, many times you must have seen that we go shopping in groups and we would like others to give their opinion about how a product how we how how it how it uh, gels in with us uh, if if others give a positive um, feedback then probably it reinforces our decision to make a purchase decision but if others are not very positive with the uh, purchase uh, perspective and that impacts our purchase decision as well so uh, this exactly is there but sometimes you know if if the person's intense negativism is there sometimes just the opposite also happens we would like to uh, stand out from the group we would like to be uh, labeled as a uh, as a rebel and that exactly is where we try to do exactly the opposite of what people want or what people wish and we would like to try to stand out from the crowd now that's also and and probably be a maverick or be a different aspect now that's also a sort of a aspect where intervening factor plays an important role now there are different type of consumer decisions uh, basically when we when we a consumer the decision uh, for modifying or postponing or avoiding a purchase decision can be influenced by certain type of risks which are there now uh, quantifying these risks i would like to add that there are basically six type of risks the first is functional risk functional risk would mean that the product does not perform as per our expectation that is the performance there's a mismatch between the performance and the expectation and rather the performance is underperformed the product underperforms and the expectation that we had from the product is very high and that basically impacts uh, a sort of a risk and we would not like to be making the specific type of a purchase decision second exactly is physical risk now a physical risk where basically the product can be a health hazard like uh, the product uh, does not actually uh, perform and and uh, as per our safety standards it, it can be detrimental to our health that exactly is also an important concern which we have to take when we exactly are uh, taking uh, into account the danger of using that product like let's say for example when you are buying a mobile phone there is a value called as sar value now that is uh, um, it's it's actually a non ionizing radiation but you would like to see how you, how much amount of radiation your mobile phone actually emits so you look at that sar value so uh, there is a specific code that you can dial in and you can find out how much amount of uh, uh, radiation is emitted by your mobile phone now if that radiation is uh, within that limit that is it, it is falling within the limit of the body mass then it is safe otherwise uh, that radiation if, if the phone is emitting lot of radiation then probably that phone can be a health hazard so you would like to not purchase that product so effectively you want to understand that the product does not create a sort of a physical risk for you okay so also we have got certain type of risks which are called as financial risk the financial risk is the product is happens to be not worth the price that you have actually paid for the product the product is underpriced or a pro product is cheap and you have paid overpriced uh, for that product so basically uh, you might feel that you have incurred a financial risk which exactly is that then there is a social risk which is also there now the social risk would mean that the product can result in an embarrassment in front of the others so let's say for example you purchase a product the product per se may not be a problem but even just the color can be a problem 
okay the sound that the product makes can be very uh, very disgusting or uh, like for example you must have seen that there are certain type of uh, motorbikes which exactly have uh, the certain type of uh, sound like for example the throttle uh, when when the, the exhaust is fitted with certain devices where basically it, it looks like a, a a gunshot has happened when 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 they accelerate but that that can be very very disturbing or a certain type of uh, um, horns which exactly are they when when blare they basically scare the people on the road so that basically is a very uh, dangerous thing and that is actually a social risk so basically you're not looked down upon you're considered as a person who's not conforming to the social norm and you would be looked down upon people will actually have a negative orientation about you in terms of now that has uh, rubbed off from basically the product that you have actually put in would like to see that there is no sort of a social risk which comes into play beyond the physical financial functional and uh, social risks so next happens to be a psychological risk a psychological risk happens to be that the product uh, affects the well mental well being of the user so let's say for example there is a product which you have purchased and uh, uh, you feel that uh, i mean uh, this is something very personal uh, that you might feel that this is a spooky product uh, some some something which is uh, uh, very not very uh, good uh, it, it it basically uh, or or let's say for example this many people might feel that this product is not very shub or it is not very good uh, i mean there there are many type of ideas that people associate with different type of products and uh, they are actually real or not but sometimes it impacts your psychological risk so, or let's say for example you have attributed product to something negative that is happening the moment you purchase it or let's say for example you purchase a product and then you met with an accident and you attribute that the accident is because of this product or you purchased it on a specific day so that can be attributed to a psychological risk i would not uh, like to comment on that but then it is impacting your well being i would say so uh, there could be nothing uh, genuine in that but then probably you got a perspective and a perception has come in that this is why exactly this product because of this product this sort of an event has happened that exactly can be attributed to something called the psychological risk the next type of a risk which can be a perceived risk is something which is called the time risk now time risk is the failure of a product results in the opportunity costing the finding of another satisfactory product let's say for example you purchase the laptop and then all of a sudden the windows actually crashes and you exactly have to have a very important video conferencing call like it happened in the last uh, uh, session where uh, everything was there uh, we we were ready for the class and all of a sudden the internet like it uh, went for a right and, and and we could not connect and and i lost to one session so uh, in fact there was no connectivity that was there i don't know what happened to that network and that network created a sort of a problem that that was that i can attribute to something called as a time risk where people lost their time we could have invested that time constructively for engaging a session and we could not because of the problem with the internet now that exactly can be attributed to a time risk so these are some of the different perceived risks which exactly encounter in the process of a purchase decision made by the consumer when they are trying to buy a consumer good or uh, coming back to the full circle that is starting with a functional risk that is the product does not function properly physical risk it causes some sort of a harm to us physically financial risk it is actually a financial harm that it causes uh, next is the social risk uh, there is a societal risk we are attributed negatively in the society psychological risk where exactly we it impacts our well being and then the time risk where basically we lose time because of the product not performing adequately now these are uh, some of the risks that are there in the buying decision process and then we have something which is called as the post purchase behavior so even before we buy we exactly have certain type of post purchase behavior which we attribute in the buying decision process now you might say that this exactly is something that is going to happen after you purchase the goods but rather i would say that we try to take into account even before we purchase the goods our behavior that is a post purchase behavior that is going to impact our making purchase of our buying decision 
Now, uh, satisfaction, as I said, is a difference between expectation and performance. So if, let's say, for example, this is the level of satisfaction and this is the level of performance. So satisfaction, if it matches performance, then probably you are uh, okay with the good. But if your if your performance actually uh, performance is high and your satisfaction is low, when your satisfaction is low and your performance of the goods is you have a low uh, satisfaction level, but the goods perform much above your satisfaction, then you're super elated. You're very very happy about it. But then uh, the inverse of it happens, and you feel that the goods has underperformed, and you would not like to purchase the goods, and you'll have a dissonance. You want to do away with the goods. You want to Get the goods out of your sight. You might even end up paying money to get the goods out of your sight because you feel that this is going to irritate you and remind you that you have made a wrong decision. So effectively, uh, we need to be that you have to promise the consumer something and then increase the offer something more. When you're going to do that, you basically end up by doing something which is called as increased expectation you're giving the goods which is more than the expectation of the consumer you're giving something which is something extra that the consumer was not promised when the customer gets that there's an element which is called the customer delight and the customer is going to get delighted he is going to be super satisfied and he's going to actually be elated by the type of goods that you have let's say for example you tell the consumer that uh, this is the price final price of the good when you actually go for the delivery of the goods you give him a gift along with good. the good the gift can be complimentary you can say since you are our valued customer we are going to give you this now this you did not promise when you are making the sales pitch but you have given something extra or you give the customer some sort of a gift voucher that is the next time you're making a purchase we are going to give you a discount this is because you are a valued customer but this is again something called as a surprise for the customer so a satisfied customer will end up purchasing the product again and also tend to say good things about the brand to others while a dissatisfied consumer may abandon or return the goods now they may seek information out if, if the goods are not returned they might even go to the lawyer and may complain directly to a group such as a business group or their own private or a social media group and they might write the reviews online with a negative orientation and this private action can be decided to stop buying the product, that is the exit option or warning friends by winding opinion. Now you must have seen online that people give their reviews as thumbs up and thumbs down, and then they people who are really irritated they go down to write uh, photographs and reviews and that lots of complaints they would be doing with about the product. So effectively, this exactly is an action of post-purchase satisfaction or post-purchase action or post-purchase use and disposal. Now, effectively, what happens is somebody who goes to that length of trying to warn people don't buy this product means the person was really irritated or properly the person was not handled with or his first purchase behavior can scare others from making that sort of a purchase decision the marketeers should also monitor how the buyers use and dispute the product now one of the key drivers of a sales frequency should be that the product's consumption rate the more quickly the buyer consumes the product the sooner they may buy the product back from the market and repurchase it now, if a consumer throws the throw, throws the product away the marketeer needs to know how they dispose it especially if things are like for example batteries or let's say beverage containers or electronic equipment and disposable uh, products it can damage the environment and can make the product opportunities if disposed products now for example i'll tell you uh, some very interesting uh, examples in this context like for example when you drink a bottle of mineral water bislary or uh, what the basic idea is that uh, the generally they say that you dispose the bottle by crushing the bottle you you actually crush the bottle so that it cannot be refilled with the uh, mineral with uh, normal tap water and uh, sealed and sold to the market again so in fact in order to protect yourself you have to take some amount of steps in order how to dispose of this bottle so that uh, this bottle is not uh, brought back into the circulation with a, uh, a product which is not as per the uh, brand uh, what exactly and it, it impacts the brand and the product per se as well so somebody um, may purchase a bottle of mineral water but probably this exactly is a, 
a dubious bottle and is purchased by this product and uh, people have already used it consumed it and thrown the bottle just recklessly and somebody picked it up filled it with tap water and uh, sealed it and sold it off and somebody uh, got really uh, sick by drinking the water and then he files a complaint to bislary or aquafina and tells them that you've given me a wrong water so effectively in order to safeguard the interest of the brand the product and the consumers it is always said how to dispose it now very interesting that uh, if you uh, there is a new way how to dispose it what you say is i i looked into a video like that that was in circulation in the social media they said that uh, don't crush the bottle if you crush the bottle what happens is probably if somebody puts in warm water in that bottle that bottle becomes it retains its shape and you can again uh, refill it and sell it so what i think that you can do is you you got the cap of that bottle which is pretty flexible you just press the cap and you put it inside the bottle so the moment the cap goes inside the bottle there is the the, the cap of the bottle the empty bottle you put the cap inside the bottle the moment you put it you cannot take it out in that case you make the product uh, such that uh, it cannot be reused so the way how you actually dispose the product is also very important now <clears throat> i will tell you a very interesting uh, case at this point of time Uh, this is uh, some something which exactly happened with uh, the product that i was uh, marketing and this is uh, shell lubes now the difference between engine oils is that you will find that uh, if you purchase the shell engine oil uh, this is the only difference it is there is that its color is actually golden while any other brand of engine oil that you purchase it will be either green or red Uh, so if you're purchasing castrol if you're purchasing benzoyl if you're purchasing uh, 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 motel if you're purchasing uh, any brand of in, in, uh, if you're purchasing that you'll have either if you look at the dye uh, any any grade of engine oil it could be a multi grade it could be a mono grade a 2p or it could be even any uh, level of engine oil all these engine oils if you're going to open the other brand you'll find them to be either red or green now the challenge uh, is but only if you are going to buy shell engine oil you are going to find that the color of that oil is actually golden you will never find a red color or a green color uh, engine oil when you come to shell the reason is we use this in order to make it as a sales pitch now the idea was that we decided to say that look why exactly is it that the other oils are colored while our brand is actually golden in color the simple reason is that they are sourced from different oil wells in different uh, countries uh, castrol pens oil or gulf lubes they they exactly are sourced from different places and then they are branded and uh, packaged and sold now what happens is when you're sourcing from different oil wells the color of the oil the the final oil is different so you basically have to have a constant product the constant brand and that exactly is where you add a dye to it when you add a red color dye or when you add a green color dye that becomes constant and then you can sell it uh, package it and sell it but that is not the case with shell because shell uses its oil from its own oil sources and it does not uh, take oil from other sources and that exactly is the reason why it has the same color for from wherever you're going to buy it so effectively that exactly gives some level of constant aspect now another aspect when you're going to add colored oil is that uh, shell oils was always uh, uh, rotella and rivula was always very very expensive when you compared to the other brands so it was difficult for us to convince people to buy but then here comes the aspect that is post purchase behavior was the reason which i used in order to sell my product even at a costlier price and people were buying it now basically what happens is engine oil basically they act as a product which exactly increase the life of your engine so uh, effectively if you put a wrong engine oil or if you put a recycled engine oil into your uh, Car or your motorbike, what is going to happen is it's going. The viscosity is going to be not there, 
and if the viscosity is not is, is lost then the excessive heat is going to happen in the in the in the chamber where the uh, actually the, the piston is going to actually create a lot of friction and this is I, one of the important aspects of my presentation which is lost because of a recycled engine oil and this basically harms your engine and your engine is going to cease and you're going to so um, probably with a wrong sort of an engine oil you are going to have a with damaged vehicle the entire engine is going to cease and that is going to be a very very costly uh, alternative very very costly uh, expense because your vehicle is not going to perform and probably it might happen when you are moving in the road or it might be some sort of a hazard or some sort of a dangerous element can happen and it might impact you and your family so effectively uh, what we used to do is that we used to tell them look this is going to happen and then there are a lot of spurious uh, oils which is actually are available in the market and in, in a place like uh, somewhere in the periphery of Aligarh um, uh, there's, there's a place I, I would not like to name it but uh, Eta, Atroli and those places I there used to be a huge amount of business where these uh, different engine oil containers used to be uh, the, uh, actually uh, this curious oil used to be created how do you create this curious oil that is very interesting um, so the engine oil that you go for a change the mechanic will not give you back that engine and not, neither will you ask for it so what happens is if he collects that engine he would collect it in the, in the container and put it in and sell it to these uh, people who are in the business of the spurious oil business. So all these engine oil, what they would do is they get this black colored oil, which is uh, coming from so all these mechanics would sell this oil and they would make extra money from these people. Now what these people would do is they would first put a magnet inside. So all the iron filings which exactly are there, they will stick to the magnet and then they will remove this magnet. Now, after they have removed all the magnet, the magnetic, that is the iron filings, uh, which exactly are the uh, elements which are coming from the rings of the piston when the lid is running in the cylinder. But once they have removed it, what they would do is they would really leave it for decantation. So all the sludge actually settles down. They, they would put it in big trunk of these uh, uh, containers, uh, these, these big drums, 330 liter drums. In which these big engine oils come and the sludge will settle in the box and then they will they will decant the uh, colored liquid so either it's a heat colored liquid or light green colored liquid that basically is the, uh, the, the oil which is the decanted oil once they get this oil they are going to add out and make it green again pack it in pouches and sell it in the market which people are going to purchase and add these spurious oils. So, so there have been so many, but you cannot do it with shell. The simple reason is that when it, you cannot add golden color to it because there's no golden dye which is available. And that exactly was the reason why we said that you cannot duplicate uh, shell engine oil, but you can duplicate any sort of a colored engine oil. And that is the reason why if you want pure uh, purity, of course that comes for a price, and then you can end up saving uh, some amount of uh, money in that context that uh, your life of your engine is going to be good and you are going to do you know basically you're paying for a standard good another reason was that our kind of uh, tanks uh, these uh, uh, big uh, drums didn't used to sell because uh, they were all sourced from a company called barber lorry barber lorry used to make this 330 liters drum but then uh, uh, if, if you're going for buying a shell uh, 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 this uh, container, nobody will buy it, no scrap dealer will buy it, simply because they understand that it cannot be used. But Castrol, Penzoil, all of them are selling for high tickets, simply because you can make uh, spurious oil in them and you can uh, remarket. So that was one of the way how we gained the trust of the people and even we were able to sell the products at a higher price. Because we said that you can be rest assured that the product that you're going to buy is actually going to be very effective for your engine and that exactly is how we ended up saying it so what i'm trying to correlate at this perspective is that buying distribution process was impacted by post purchase use and disposal 
of the products as well. So post-purchase behavior also plays a very important role in the context of uh, making a purchase decision. Now, consumer product use and dispose. If you can look at this slide, you can see the product. Yes, Arma, are you making a point? You wish to make a point? Yes, sir. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes, sir. About the point that you are trying to make us understand about post purchase, disposal, and use. Basically, yes. so if we talk about uh, it, then the most recent example that we can see in the market is that of eco friendly products. Because okay. the main idea behind eco friendly products is how they are going to be used and disposed of without, without harming the environment. So, it is a very right. recent example that could be put in that category as well. Okay. You can you can share it uh, if you have that example with the group. Yes, sir. For example, if we talk about fast fashion brands such as H and M, they have uh, an entire conscious line which is uh, made out of uh, sustainable uh, products, sustainable materials, so that the disposable of uh, disposal of those materials is more easy. And also, uh, our, an Indian brand known as uh, Roaster. They have garments uh, which are environment friendly, which are recycled. Basically, they are made out of recycled uh, materials. Okay. Uh, excellent. Thank you very much, uh, Arma, for making that uh, value addition at this perspective. Uh, that reminds me of another very interesting brand, um, Samsung. Samsung, they have uh, come up with uh, the, their mobile phones, which they say that there are certain components in it which are. Uh, made out of recycled plastics and this recycled plastics has come from you know where a fishing nets uh, there are certain fishing nets which exactly are uh, tossed in the sea when they become useless and these fishing nets basically they harm the wild uh, the animals because animals are caught within these fishing nets and then they die so what happens is in uh, japan and other places they started cleaning the seabed that is the floor of the sea and they decided to pick up these fishing nets now these fishing nets uh, they exactly are huge plastic uh, products so what they did was what to do with this product rather than landfilling they decided to recycle it and then make it into mobile phones or components for mobile phones plastic components are recycled from there so effectively they say that uh, this is a component which is actually or even the packaging material uh, that exactly is also recycled. So effectively, yes, uh, very rightly said that uh, disposable products actually can come into handy when you can make real value use for them when you add some uh, dimension to it, wherein you can say that uh, how disposable a product has also a value so which you can be incorporating in the uh, uh, entire scheme of things. So excellent. Uh, I must really say a very valid perspective made by you at this first point. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so uh, when, when we have a product basically towards its use and disuse, how to get rid of it temporarily, how to get rid of it permanently and how to keep it. These are the three decisions that you can take when you are going to actually uh, use for any sort of a product. Uh, to get rid of it uh, permanently, you can either trade it, you can either give it away, you can give after its uh, entire life is over. We generally, with many products, what we do is we try to when we have used the product and we feel that we don't want to use it or we want to buy a new product, what we do is we try to give it to somebody who exactly might be using it. Or you can either sell it, like for example, you have got this OLX, uh, you must have seen is a platform which has come where it's a C2C market has come in that you can trade off your uh, as a consumer, you can sell it to another consumer. Uh, the product that exactly you want to get rid of permanently or you can throw it away. Now, the idea is uh, when you want to uh, sell it, when you want to trade it or when you want to give it away, it can be resold, it can be used or it can be uh, given directly to the consumer. When you want to actually sell it, you can give it directly to the consumer is through a middleman or to the middleman you can actually sell it. Like for example, there's a context like scrap. Uh, many times what happens, the vehicles who have used 15 years of their lifestyle, you actually have to scrap it. Yes, Pratika, you want to make a point? Like uh, uh, about the, uh, like uh, for uh, menstruation, uh, women, women hygiene layer, like uh, so many products are com coming out, like the menstrual cup. And as well as like uh, in Europe, every year, I was uh, 
going through an article, I figured out that every year a large number of clothes are discarded. So okay. people are coming with the uh, with the so many things like uh, recyclable bricks, ecological bricks. Yes, uh, you can you can go for recyclable bricks. You can even go for landfilling. There are many things. For example, the landfilling which are done. So what you can do is, but we have to see that these actually are decomposable products. That is the products they decompose. Otherwise, you know, they're going to choke the earth and they're going to create some sort of a problem. So rather than uh, you can, you've given the example of bricks, you know, bricks, you can, you can incorporate it into bricks. Uh, one important aspect at this point of time that comes to my mind is, you know, that Pirelli burning that has happened uh, actually, which exactly becomes yes, a huge economical, uh, it becomes a huge uh, environmental disaster every post winter when the harvesting has happened. And uh, these uh, farmers, when they, they want to burn their crops, uh, it is not the crops, it's basically the remaining shaft they want to burn. Uh, so what they want to do is they want to get the ash. When they want to get the ash, they want to sprinkle it. What they do is there's a huge amount of burning. Now this creates a lot of smog. When this creates the smog, this basically chokes us. And you see, this happens in the entire uh, northwestern belt of country that is surrounding Delhi and Punjab and Haryana and Uttar Pradesh and things like that. There is a huge amount of Pirelli burning that is happening, and this basically becomes a, a disaster for the environment. The entire uh, many a times, you know, even we have to close the entire city. We have to send the children uh, to homes because we can't have schools because it's just choking. It chokes your lungs. The entire uh, country goes into a, uh, a ransom state where basically this uh, really creates. So many times what happens is uh, how to solve this sort of problem. So here comes the use and disposal of those goods. So many uh, projects, there was, I remember a Swiss project which was underway, which said that uh, these products were basically, uh, you can make bricks out of this product. You can make certain type of, you can use these straw as a reinforcement for bricks and you can use these bricks for different type of elements and then you can when when you have these bricks which exactly have actually formed you can burn these bricks in kiln and and these are electrical kilns and or you can even use the cemented bricks which exactly you can see so you don't need to actually heat it but uh, basically uh, but when you're making these cement bricks and you can use these as uh, reinforcements uh, these uh, different Pirelli. So the, the different uses. So how you actually going to do it? Very very innovative, and you got to be very uh, careful as to how you go about it, so that you have a product use and then a proper disposal. You should not just uh, litter the goods here and there. That's a very important aspect towards uh, this aspect. Thank you very much for uh, your input as well at this perspective. Uh, coming down to the moderating effect on consumer decision making. Uh, there are certain low involvement consumer decision making and there are certain variety seeking buying behavior which is there. Now the expectancy value model assumes that a high level of consumer involvement or engagement or active processing uh, for the consumer is there when they undertake in responding to the marketing stimulus. So let's say for example I have a stimulus which comes to me and then says that I need to be uh, that, that triggers me. Let, let's say, for example, you can buy an uh, electric vehicle and this electric vehicle is going to actually uh, cut your running cost. It's going to be environment friendly, less uh, um, uh, less burden on the, uh, the state exchequer. So effectively, uh, this is a very good option to purchasing a, a, a carbon uh, vehicle rather than a, pet a petrol vehicle, but rather you can go for a electric vehicle. Now, the, the, basically all, all of us trigger. So uh, this basically uh, has given us a high amount of, uh, so earlier when I'm going to buy a vehicle, when I'm going to be uh, given to this sort of stimulus, that is going to be my, my, uh, my decision is also going to impact the environment where I'm going to live, that takes it a high involvement. So a decision making, whether it is a low involvement or whether it's a high involvement is also a very important thing. I'll give you a very interesting insight into it. I also work with a, a cement manufacturing unit. Uh, I, I was uh, one of their uh, marketing consultants for cement man manufacturing. And that became a very important aspect as to how to sell cement. Now, cement manufacturing, cement is a very different type of a product, let's say. Uh, generally, it is made up of slag. And slag actually is a byproduct of 
something else that is exactly uh, you've got the basic slag you've got acidic slag so uh, slag is actually uh, from let's say uh, you've got this type of uh, uh, steel making that you, you make steel you've got the limestone slag which exactly is actually a byproduct and then they create a steel uh, cement out of it and this cement can be used for construction and infrastructure now how do you when you brand the cement how do you actually sell it so now cement basically who exactly is the influencer for cement when you want to make a house you don't decide on what type of a cement you're going to buy you don't understand about uh, uh, the uh, different grades of cement Okay, so you don't know, need about high settings in cement. You don't know about uh, the different OPC, TPC. You don't know uh, about the different categories of cement, which is the fast setting, which is the slow setting, which is used for what. So you you basically are not technically aware when you want to make a house or you want to do some sort of a construction. So you go to your mason. Now the mason guides you or the uh, contractor who's designing or the city engineer who's designing your building. He is going to guide you on what cement. Now, exactly is it uh, that as a marketer how do i sell my brand so it was a very interesting challenge to do business in the area of uh, cement marketing and uh, uh, marketing was something that actually i had actually uh, a real passion for which is i did multiple careers i was in the marketing department for different things it gave me a lot of insight into this subject and that is uh, very important so um, it is important that you take a decision when you're buying a product which is not an involvement product. Eventually, you might think that cement is a low involvement product, but it's a very high involvement product. Why? Because, you're, because you don't make house every day. Okay, you may buy a bottle of uh, cold drink, you can buy coffee, you can buy coke. That's, not, that's an impulsive purchase. You just feel thirsty, whatever you see, you'd like to buy it. And it does not matter whether you drink that tea, and, and you have to drink that tea to survive it. So you can try that one and try coke that next time. So it's a solo involvement. But when you're making a house, you are spending a like part of your investment. You are having your dream, which is culminating into a uh, a board, your home. You're not making a house. You're making a home. The home is for your entire family. Many uh, things, and you do it once or twice in a life. Right. So that exactly. I mean, you want your people to stay. You want your children, you want your parents, you want your siblings, you want your wife, you want your entire family to be safe within that house. You don't want it to collapse. Is it? You, you, you're not because you can all it and you want to make sure the basket is very, very sound. That is where I translated into a low involvement product to a high involvement product. Not that I tried to scare them, but I told them the value of making a wise decision, of making a wise uh, informed decision and not getting carried away by just uh, the influencer, which is actually is a mason because he might get some sort of a benefit out of uh, 100 bags that he's going to sell. If he didn't get about five rupees per bag, so with 100 bags, he's going to get 500 rupees just for that. So you have to make a house, you have to decide which type of a grade of cement is required, what exactly is the point of saturation, what exactly the um, the point at which it, the cement actually sets in, how long it's going to take, what is the water amount of water you need to give in order for it to set it, and so on and so forth. So effectively, what really happens is that your involvement plays a very important role when you are making a consumer. Like, for example, as I said in the case of your motorbike servicing, when you go, uh, the mechanic is going to say, oil dalna or मेरा कोई रिस्पांसिबिलिटी नहीं है इंजन खराब हो जाएगा आप शेल डालिए ये ये डालिए मुझे मालूम है आपको तो एंजॉय नहीं डालना है एंजॉय डालेंगे तो मेरी रिस्पांसिबिलिटी है उसकी कौन सी रिस्पांसिबिलिटी है आई टेल यू व्हाट इज हिज टेक इन दैट व्हेन यू बाय अ कंटेनर व्हेन यू बाय अ 1 लीटर और 1 एंड 1/2 लीटर और 600 ml ऑफ दैट कंटेनर फॉर एनी योर एंजॉय द मोमेंट यू ओपन द कैप व्हेन यू ओपन द कैप देयर इज अ स्मॉल स्टिकर just below the cap. And when you only open the cap, plastic cap, below, below the cap is a round sticker. If you take that sticker out, you will find it says 10 rupees. So what happens is, even if he gives you back that bottle, he will take that sticker out, the every, the every mechanic. And these stickers they will collect. So let's say, for example, if he has cleaned 20, 
uh, points. In, in 20, he has serviced 20 vehicles in a day, and he has saved that 10 rupees. So this 10 rupee token, he's going to give it back to the shopkeeper and take 20 into 10, 200 rupees per day he's going to pocket. Now that is his only income. I'm not saying that oil is bad, but this is a way of subtle way of influencer marketing, which is done by organization. I'm, I'm not saying whether it's ethical or unethical, but this is how it happens. So effectively, you know, you have to be very careful when you want to make a specific type of decision. So I'm not saying that you become all high involvement for every product. I'm, I'm not trying to actually tell you, but as a marketer, when you're sitting on the other side of the table, you need to know all the dynamics and the nuances that actually go in the sales of a actually product and the consumer decision making so that when you design your strategies you put every place in bring the right perspective so that the product actually sells. now some situations are characterized by low involvement but significant brand difference uh, here consumers often do a lot of brand switching so if, if two products are nearly same in terms of quality or in prices consumers might want to switch the brand and try to see what exactly is something different they're getting, getting from another type of a product or a service per se now, there's something which is called behavioral economics. Now, when I'm talking about behavioral economics, basically we're talking about decision which is about the availability heuristic, the representative heuristic, or the answering and adjustment heuristic. And something which is called as framing, that is something which is called a mental accounting. Mentally, we are trying to do the accounting. So, let's say what exactly we mean by the decision heuristic. That is, uh, behavioral uh, theorists have, have come up with different types of consumers making irrational choices. So, available heuristics. Now, consumers may base their predictions on quickness and ease with which they want to have a specific type of an outcome. For example, it comes to mind too easily and might overestimate the light of it happening. For example, a uh, recent product failure may lead to consumers to, evaluate, to inflate the likelihood of a future product failure to make more inclined to is a product warranty. So many a times when you want to uh, make a product, they say that we are going to give you an extended warranty or this warranty is uh, extended to, for uh, extension of the uh, risk that you have. The risk is extended for a larger period of time and you can buy this extended warranty. Now, this gives you some level of confidence that this product is not going to fail. And if it's going to fail, you basically are covered. So this is called as the availability heuristics. Okay. Now, there is something which is called as a representative heuristics. Now, representative heuristics would mean that the consumers would base their prediction on how representative or similar the outcome of an other example. Like, for example, one reason package appearance may be so similar for different brands in the same category that marketers want their products to be seen as a representative of the category as a whole. Like for example, I'll give you the certain type of brand names. Uh, when, when you're uh, going to a place, uh, many times for brushing, they use a term which is called as Colgate. Now Colgate basically happens to be a representative brand for all uh, oral care. Uh, Colgate, yeah, yeah. And it's not basically, they're basically not asking you to brush your hair. Yeah, did you take care of your own needs? They're not saying that, they say, oh, yes, yeah. That's why you have a economic context tonight because uh, I've been very closely associated with this market, uh, high street market, especially for engine oil. Uh, when you go to the um, petrol pump, today, the concept is not there, but then there were two wheelers. Uh, they would say, mobile dal dena. What is mobile? Mobile is actually a brand name of an engine oil. Okay, now mobile actually when you, when you go to there uh, uh, and it says Tuti Dalo, Tuti is the actual grade name. If you have got four T for four stroking it and two T for two stroking it. So generally, what happens when you add a petrol, you add two T to it because that goes into the engine. And and for four stroke, you don't need to add uh, this because that is uh, there in a different. You have to add engine oil in a different location. That that is uh, actually uh, capillarly that is driven to the engine or by a pump. Effectively, it's, it's the mechanism of both the stokes are different. So uh, uh, IC engine and CIA. So effectively, what really happens is when you're adding in a two-stroke engine, you say 
टूटी डाल दो या इंजन ऑयल डाल दो नोबडी इज गोइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड बट इफ इन मोबाइल डाल दो दे विल पुट इट बिकॉज़ मोबाइल मोबाइल इज जस्ट अ ब्रांड नेम इट्स लाइक एनी अदर ब्रांड नेम एक्स वाई जेड जैसे कोलगेट किया गया कोलगेट नहीं दैट कोलगेट इज ब्रांड नेम ऑफ अ ओरल केयर कंपनी बट बेसिकली दे हैव एटीट्यूडेड अ ब्रशिंग टू कोलगेट that exactly is the type of anchoring and adjustment heuristics that exactly has happened and uh, service marketing we exactly have a very uh, long amount of favorable anchors to the subsequent experience that i be interpreted uh, all the more uh, in the favorable light uh, decision making is a manner in which the choice is presented and seen by a decision maker like for example mental accounting what is mental accounting is based on certain four set of It's very different from the accounting that you're learning in your club, accounting class. So mental accounting is something very different. What happens is consumers tend to segregate gains when a seller has a product with more than one positive dimension. Uh, it desires to have the consumers evaluate each dimension separately, listing multiple benefits of a large uh, aspect. For example, you can make a sum of the parts look greater than the whole. Like, like say, for example, it says that when you're going to buy any sort of a product, it has got these features, and these individual features are greater than the benefit of the whole product. So probably breaking if if a product can do ten things at a time, if a product can do twenty things at a time. So you can buy the product because it performs in ten different situations in twenty different situations. so effectively they want to make hello can you hear me yes sir Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible. Thank you. Thank you. We had a small search, uh, 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 a data search that was signaled out here. So we had to had a, a small, but good that we we connected back again. Uh, so consumers also try to integrate smaller losses with larger gains. The cancellation principle might ex- accept that by withholding taxes. for monthly paychecks is less painful than making large sum tax payments and the smaller sum withholdings may overshadow the large payment so effectively what happens is let's say for example i say that fine what i'm going to do is i'm going to give you if you paying me up front i'm going to give you a cd cd is a cash discount i'm going to give you a 4% cd so let's say for example if you're paying a product for 100 rupees you don't need to pay if you're giving me 100 rupee cash i am going to give you a cd of 4% that is equal to purchase i am give you 96 rupees i am going to pay 4 rupees i am going to give it back to you now generally what happens is or uh, what i can do is when i am going to give it to a retailer or a dealer or a wholesaler a wholesaler might end up giving something which is called as a, a credit base now credit days means i'm going to give you a 15 day credit so you can make me the same payment which i you can make me today you can make me the same payment after 15 days now after 15 days when you're going to make me the payment effectively what i have given is i've given you a benefit of this 15 days now when i'm going to give you the benefit of this 15 days you can and 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 the same discount so either you pay me today or you are pay me after 15 days So effectively, what happens is the person might end up giving me only after 15 days, but not today because he is going to get the same benefit of paying me. He can go to use that money for something else. So effectively, what I have done is I have staggered my payment so as to give him some sort of a benefit. Now I will tell you a very interesting story of one of my dealers. Now I it was this dealer of mine who basically told me this sort of a context because this dimension. is exactly what happens when it comes to and uh, mental accounting was something that was very interesting now uh, what he used to do was uh, that i used to go i used to find that this dealer was the same person taking any any problem i would like all of you to voice mute and if you want to so there is some uh, there is some 
So there are some breakages yeah. in your voice. Like sometimes you're audible, sometimes okay, you're not. Okay, okay. I'm I'm sorry. I'll just try to repeat. Uh, thank you for bringing that into attention. Uh, it could be because of the network issues. Can you hear me now clearly? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, yes sir. You. Audible. Yes, thank sir. You're audible. Thank you very much. So uh, I had this uh, dealer of mine who basically uh, whose whose uh, case study I'm going to right now talk about, which basically accounts to this dimension of behavioral economics that is framing or mental accounting. Now, what this dealer used to do was that he used to be the star dealer of that entire territory, and everybody used to come to his shop to buy products. The, like for example, he used to have a monopolistic sort of market control. And so I decided to find out how he used to do it. What is the dynamics? Because one was that I thought that he is undercutting the price. He's going to sell it for real cheap. But he never used to sell cheap. He used to sell at the price in which we, we were supposed to sell. So he was not making any sort of a, a small uh, cost cutting activity at that end. So I decided to look into the dynamics that how he actually operated. One very interesting thing came out was that he told me let's see there is a person called as a okay now as a person called as a he comes to his shop let's say on the first of the month okay so what he does is he gives him goods and says that you have to pay me only 50 percent of the value of the goods that you have. let's say the person has and he says so you're not audible okay 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 i'm sorry yes so your, your voice is breaking so much is it so i think there's some problem with the internet that is actually there okay i want all of you to pick up a piece of paper that is greater amount of understanding so in case uh, there is any sort of a glitch I want other people to pick up a piece of paper and a pen so that you can follow as to what I'm trying to actually say. Um, incidentally, I'm not carrying a, the a device uh, for connecting. Otherwise, I would have. I'll try to do that in the next class. I'll try to put uh, uh, this uh, marker uh, which exactly is there. So let's say, for example, there's a dealer called as A. Uh, there, there, there's a person called as A. And he purchases goods worth rupees hundred on day one. Okay, so you can uh, have it something like this uh, written uh, hundred and the the or, or what I can do is I can just try to open a word file. Just give me one minute. What I'll try to do is I'll try to open a word file so that I can project that. That's going to give you some level of. Uh, uh, aspect so that you can actually look into what is happening so uh, out here i am going to just project the screen okay so uh, just give me a minute. I'm going to project. I'm going to take this slide off and I'm going to project another screen. Stop this. Project my word file. Okay, can you see the word file, all of you? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, excellent. So let's say uh, on the uh, this is uh, the first of the uh, first uh, first of the month. Let's say first of Feb. Okay, first of Feb. There's this uh, person called as Mr. A. He buys a goods worth hundred rupees, and uh, he makes a payment of only rupees fifty. Okay. Now, on 15th of Feb, Mr. A is supposed to give rupees 
25 here okay for this and now when mr a has again come to pi the next time he is purchasing another goods worth rupees 100 so for this 100 he has paid 50 rupees okay now on 28th of february or on 1st of march what happens is mr a comes and makes a payment of only 12.50 for the first goods that he has purchased okay and he makes a payment of uh, rupees 25 for the second goods that he has purchased plus he makes a purchase of rupees 100 over here again uh, sorry uh, he, he makes a purchase of rupees 100 here again and for this he has made a payment of uh, only 50 plus uh, 12.5 uh, for this one and then uh, for, for this one he has paid 12.5 and for this he has made uh, sorry he he's made a payment of uh, 12.5 for this one for the first goods that he had purchased okay for this he has made up a, a payment of rupees and for this he has again paid 50 rupees Effectively, what has happened is he has never finished the payment for the first goods that he purchased on 1st of February. Now, in 15th of March, what happens is uh, 15th of March, uh, Mr. A again comes to his shop and purchases another goods worth rupees 100 because he, he needs to purchase these goods uh, because he wants to purchase sorry he, he wants to purchase keep purchasing these goods and uh, effectively what happens is he purchases another uh, goods worth rupees uh, sorry for rupees 100 over here so effectively every 15 days he makes a purchase of rupees for, for this he makes a payment of 6.25 and for this he makes a payment of 12.5 for this he makes a payment of 25 and then he makes a payment of uh, 50 uh, again for the goods he has purchased now if you're going to actually add this up horizontally you will find 50 75 85 87.5 is what this comes up to and for this you see only 75 and this actually is 50 so effectively you see as he goes across his goods are actually being sold and 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 then he is going to be nearing it and then he says that your credit never ends you have never paid for the full amount if you calculate this down 50 75 87.5 87 88 9, 90, 91 92 93 so effectively it is nearly 92 or 93.75 or so on but this is also not complete and this exactly goes on so effectively uh, people are feeling that their credit is perpetual for every good that they are purchasing now uh, i hope uh, i have been able to uh, make this thing uh, clear to you uh, towards uh, can can you just follow it yes hello yes sir okay. so effectively yes, sir. what has happened is uh, this person has actually created a situation wherein he has mentally handcuffed all his 